by Mr. Mohsin Firmezi, Global Head Business Development, TPS. Mr. Mohsin is digital distribution evangelist with over 22 years of rich experience across banking, telecom, supply chain and distribution channels. His banking experience covers self-service retail banking channels, corporate cash management, home remittances and the mobile wallet services. His consulting experience with Pakistan Microfinance Network and Central Bank of Pakistan targeted utilizing of non-banking agent network for digital financial inclusion. So now, I'll just hand over the mic to Mr. Mosi. Thank you, Tajik, for uh, the kind introduction. Uh, the Amra team, uh, thank you very much for giving TPS this opportunity. And thank you, everyone, for sparing your time out today, this afternoon, and uh, seeing of what I have to talk about, uh, sharing my experiences with the Bangladeshi friends and how the, we see the close similarity that's happening in the countries that we are working globally and in Bangladesh. So before I you know, uh, do the PowerPoint, I want to know what you guys are uh, looking for in the presentation. So it will help that I can uh, you know, can I have some show of hands of people who are from the banking fraternity? So, so I would understand what the audience looks like. Right? And rest, I think this is uh, some telecom operator folks. They say, who works for telcos? And the third piece that I will be talking about today is the PSPs, the payment service providers, the third party payment service providers. I. So this, uh, so I, I, I wonder if there is anybody who's uh, from that community. Okay, so today what we talk about is uh, digitizing taka payments. While everybody is talking about, you know, getting rid of cash around the world, we have to see where are we headed towards while we are trying to do this uh, within different countries. So what I've realized over the years is that, and, and over the you know the larger framework, there is a lot of work that is going on into digital financial inclusion. So including people who are not so <coughs> privileged and they do not have access to formal financial services. So while we are doing this, so the larger cause that is being done for is to get people into the net, into the formal financial services net, so that their livelihoods could improve. And uh, while I was having this discussion with multiple uh, you know, economists, there have been varied studies saying of if the actual financial inclusions make an impact on the livelihood of the poor. And it has been uh, in multiple studies if they have enough evidence that it does make a difference. <coughs> Just to profile, uh, you know, again, you guys, I will keep you engaged as well. So how many people of, amongst my audience today have a bank account? Can I have show of hands? Almost there. And the people who have a digital wallet. So, six, seven percent. Right? So, so what I will do is today, we'll talk about what banks are doing good at, what are they good at, what are telcos good at, how are they connecting together to achieve this larger agenda. So today what, uh, as I said, so the agenda will comprise of, so talking about what's happening in the broths of banks, telcos, and the payment service providers. We'll also talk about how we can connect the dots. So there's too much activity happening, but there needs to be the connection of the dots. So how can banks build up a compelling payment proposition? So and we talk about that. Then we talk about digitizing the value chains. So while so everybody is familiar and I was delighted to know the garment industry and see that in action. So there are a lot of employment that is around that. So the whole value chain of that uh, garment manufacturing and apparel manufacturing 
So, like all of these value chains, how what benefits would be achieved by digitizing this? And then creating a digital financial ecosystem. And last but not the least, what I'll talk about is TPS Groups' achievements <coughs> and our partnership with uh, Amra Technologies. So there might be a little off here and there. Uh, so 22 million bank people in a country of 166 million people. And a wallet base of around 30 so million. We're seeing that there is a progressive increase of digital wallets against the banking accounts. So what are they doing right? And what are banks supposed to do? What they can, what, what what they can build upon the successes that they have achieved over the years to converge to that digital financial inclusion agenda. That's what primarily that we'll be talking about. So, <clears throat> so not only uh, so I while I am doing this presentation, uh, I have my own personal experiences as a <clears throat> sorry as a practitioner, as a banker, and a technology enthusiast. So during my days at Citibank and Samba, so I've learned across different things that the banking world folks do and what they aspire for in terms of unit, running their own businesses, business units. But it all starts from here. So I wonder if the people at the back can see this, is this small? So the hierarchy of the financial services needs. And if you look at the base of the pyramid, it is having a secure account for holding payment transaction funds. So it all started from there where the primary need was borrowing and the bankers thought that the, the only way that they can enable that borrowing phenomena to happen was to give them a banking account. So this resulted into this. So the Bangladesh financial ecosystem right now having about 9,000 or 9,051 branches. The, the numbers might be a little odd because I've taken them from other sources. It's about 6,000 odd ATMs. So 18,000 MFI branches <clears throat> and 31 FIs. So look at the stark contrast between the number of branches and ATMs connected together. They still do not make up 18,000. But is this uh, you know, physical delivery of financial services infrastructure scalable, considering the, the, the rush timings that we see at Dhaka and uh, the financial the, the scalability of the financial services delivery points is really, uh, you know, it's not only in Dhaka but it's everywhere. In the country that I come to from Pakistan, we have a similar set of issues. The number of branches have stored around 12,000. So in a country of 180 million population and your country of 165 66 million population, the financial services points are never enough. What happened? Where did we miss the boat? So my read is the financial institutions, while focusing to target on the borrowing needs of the customers, missed on the opportunity of why they are borrowing. So if it's an entrepreneur, it is borrowing to pay its supply chain. Right? If it's a, it's a retail customer, he needs to get credit to manage his obligations. All of this is connected to other companies and other individuals. So borrowing, while is a need of, of a person, of, of an individual, it is not the entire, does not picture the, contain the entire story. So borrowing had to be backed up with a payment services business, which Eventually, so when banks figured out that this is not what is making it grow bigger. So the people that they sold accounts to, they were migrating 
them to electronic bill payments. So no, the utility bill payments, their own internet bill payments. And for the people who are borrowing, so they need to pay their own value chain and their supply chains. So between these two blocks, there was a missed opportunity, which was then realized and people started working on it. Bank banking sector started working on it. So what happened on the telco side of the world? They started off from requiring a payment services business because they wanted airtime transfers, the P2P airtime transfers. Then once they did that, they suddenly realized that this is enough activity to engage their 50 odd million customers or 35 odd million customers and there is a hole which has left been, been left open by the bankers which was delivering these payment services so looking at that opportunity they grew to capture that opportunity they thought that opening up a mobile wallet or an account where you can store funds either to be used as airtime or either to be used as for purchases can be open. So, so they thought that this is the business that they want to get into. But then came the regulator. So, and it's happening, you know, in a lot of other places as well. Where the regulator is for the customer protection and enabling the larger, uh, you know, customers not to be cheated or because it's a problem of the funds and again the whole systemic risk that can be uh, that can originate from getting to an alternate currency so the and this is a challenge for all the central bankers and I have been consulting with the state bank of Pakistan so the primary reason is that so you have a mode of payment, there is, a, there is a currency system, there is a value transfer system. So with this, with enabling the telecom operators and looking at their marketing skills, there was a systemic risk into the business whereby airtime could be a pseudo currency. That had to be stopped. <coughs> so, so once that was put in place, then the telecom operators looked at the opportunity, what bankers used to do is, is the extending the credit. For all the people who have used postpaid accounts, or prepaid accounts rather, you would be familiar with emergency credit, right? So there is, you dial a static something code, and then you are given a small balance which you can utilize. What these telco folks are doing, so they are looking at the behavior of the customer to utilize that credit and pay. So that is being used as a proxy to figure out his credit behavior. So in multiple parts of the world what's happening is that these telecom operators have a lot of quarter data about the customer. So what is he doing? How many calls does he make? How many calls does he get? When he makes the call? Where, where is he traveling to? Is he at a, is a static location? So believe you me, there is a lot of data in a single call and I am working with one of the projects on this. There's a 52 data elements that are captured with one single call. But it's, as credit risk professionals, we are all working across uh, proxies. <coughs> so what is happening eventually? Bringing more and more people into the, into the formal financial, uh, financial services delivery. So it happens via bank or it happens via telco. So the larger interest is getting more people to get formal financial services from their respective providers. And hence we see that the curve, the way that I look at it and other folks, so from an airtime transfer to, to wallets, then came billing, which is bill payments, then the payroll transfers, I'm sure all of this if I have some friends from Bcash who joined us, they would have doing 
be doing this whole things. So payroll accounts, then comes the worker remittances. So you have an account, so the only way that you can recharge is going to an agent, or you have your father or brother who is working in a Bangladeshi diaspora over the overseas, can send you funds directly into the wallet. Retail, e-commerce, ATMs, savings, this is the way that, and microfinance and, and health and agri and all of that. So the value proposition is growing, touching different value verticals, gradually converting the whole cash transactions back into digital framework. So <clears throat> I pulled this up from the Bangladesh Bank website. So I saw some, you know, uh, globally the number of active wallets uh, that are typically is, is around 20, 22, 20 to 22 percent. In Bangladesh, it, it, the number is around 47 percent. So when I was discovering the why this is happening, I got to know these two elements. So about 11 million people are active wallet users and look here. So the 40 percent growth in inward remittances and 42 percent growth in utility bill payments. So the wallet usage is powered by the inward remittances and bill payments. What are the learnings? What are the learnings to be learned by the banks? Another snapshot. You know, so so 43 percent active customers. So mobile financial services about 3,900 odd ATMs where Bcash and like other uh, services are can be cashed out. I wonder if a lot of people know and I had a chat with the Bcash folks uh, day before yesterday and if I have a Bcash wallet I can go to an ATM and do a cash out without a card. So they have done it for a limited scale but they, the service is already available. So what I see is that there is some lessons to be learned from the people who are doing it right. So the importance of the payment services is realized and is quickly being worked upon. So when I look at the you know the regulatory landscape, I see opportunities all around in, in what Bangladesh is doing and they're doing it correctly. So you've recently done RTGS. So from the time that we are doing in, in my country as well, so RTGS enabled a lot of other you know interbank settlement transactions which will which will achieve much more operational efficiencies. It will not only connect the bank accounts amongst themselves, but it will put up an infrastructure where the unbanked wallets and the bank accounts will be able to interoperate. That's something that we did in Pakistan about six years ago. Six years or four years ago, I'm sorry. So electronic funds transfer, that's also a new newest uh, you know. So I also got to know that you've gotten some now ECIDs to the Credit Information Bureau, you can put it electronically. So then very recently and very interestingly, the Bangladesh Bank has come up with PSP regulations, which is enabling third party entities to play a, a role in dialogue and digital dividend to be achieved from the whole execution. Uh, some enablers, so access to information, I was I've kept on rating about it. Uh, a phenomenal, uh, you know, initiated by the Prime Minister Secretariat. So recently, uh, the governor's Bangladesh Bank has signed up with the uh, Better Than Cash Alliance. So Better Than Cash Alliance is a global organization which uh, enables countries to commit to digitization of the government flows. So be it be the government to person payments, or be it other. Uh, you know, procurement transactions. Just like we saw in the e-service uh, doorstep, the e-government e uh, initiative. So what needs to be done? So, and the lessons learned is to build a compelling proposition of payment services with the banking products. So it's not only the card for an ATM withdrawal. It is card to do to enable the customers for performing different payment services. Let me talk about this. But essentially, I put it as five C's of enabling a 
a payment service proposition. So cost effective, when you're taking the, the payments digital, the banks are saving truckloads of money in terms of cash, logistics, and cash handling, and the risks associated with it. So with my time as a transaction banking head at one of the banks in Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, so in our economies, which are credit, which are cash, you know, overloaded economies, so we we could the distributors that were our customers would have their trucks going places to places, dropping in the goods and collecting money, and in the evening they would dump all the cash at the bank counters and choke the teller and all of that stuff. So with payment services, there is enough meat to be saved, right? It will serve. It will propagate if the saves are shared with the customer. Confidence, if the customer is confident that the transaction that he is performing would be scalable and he will be able to do it repetitively. Convenience, should be able to make that at the choice of his device or his uh, access of information point. Communication is very necessary, so the customer needs to be told what he is uh, engaging into, so that there is a constant, you know, so there is a repetitive use built up uh, with the customer, and obviously convergence with the with so many devices penetrating. Convergence is absolutely necessary. Payment proposition that match the consumer lifestyle will drive usage. That's the essence of it. So, how can banking accounts build value proposition with payment services? So, as I said, plastic card, not only for cat, ATM cash withdrawals. There's more to it. So building services where the card can be used on retail for bill payments and all that stuff. So, payment services would differentiate the value proposition for account holders. Utility bill payments, mobile top-ups, and lifestyle payments. If we can build propositions around them, definitely there will be an uptake of the banking products. So enable a direct banking which is an internet or mobile banking, channels to beef up the credit card or debit card engagements. And then last but not the least is what I will say is about the prepaid business and I will just explain of how I, I foresee that business to be built. Uh, of the audience, any banker who has issued a prepaid card yet? So, so there are some uh, prepaid card instances in, in Bangladesh but they need to be beefed up, right? Dragged up. That which channel do you engage with, be it ATM, POS, or you know, cloud, internet, you get to engage with the customer across this with a simple and convergent uh, So that's what we do in, as one of the products at TPS. So we connect all these channels. So we sit in the middle and we get information from all the alternate delivery channels with different form factors, be it a teller interface, ATM, mobile banking, mobile wallets, retail agents, POS, internet banking, and we can connect to the core banking systems. So we sit in the middle and we, we allow the bankers to be creative about the access channels. So, and when I said about the PSPs, so how are PSPs getting there in terms of the financial services or financial inclusion agenda? So we talked about how banks are doing it, what roles can telcos play, and how can PSPs play a role in it. So as we built up the payment services proposition, typically what used to happen in our country as well, there was a bilateral relationship. So if I want to collect electricity bill, so I would be a bank, I would go to an electricity company, do a bilateral arrangement, and then my counters will be enabled to do those uh, utility bill collections. But this is not scalable. So with, imagine 56 banks all going to do those utility companies and merchants, engaging with them, and then there will be a nightmare of settlements. So this, so our country went through this as well and we figured out that this is not right. TPS converged this mechanism. So what we did was that instead of this building this mesh network, 
we sit in the middle, we provide a, a clean interface to the banks and connect them to the billers. So, though it looks like, uh, you know, a payment services proposition, but this is really, so the way that I look at it, it's spurring entrepreneurship. Again, okay, now that we have talked about banks, telecom operators, and the payment service providers, how they are enabling the you know the digital payment services. So let's talk about now on the issuance side. So the way I look at it is the bankers have to be smart enough to create, you know as I said, affinity orbits. So affinity orbit is, so as a personal motion, I, when I, let's say, I think of entertainment, there is an orbit that I'm moving to. So it will be, let's say, activity X, activity Y, activity Z, I move in an orbit. So, and it's not only mostly that is moving in that orbit. There are other customers who are also moving in that orbit. So what I see is that we can, now the financial services enable is to create affinity prepaid wallets. So I, I'll quote some examples. So for example, back to school wallet. So this is a concept for, you know, people who touch that orbit, where kids are going back to school. So there is a prepaid card that is distributed to those consumers who have this need of uh, either school fee payments, school accessories, footwear, books, dining and entertainment. So all of this club together to create a value proposition and a card. So while we create orbits of the customers in which they move, we get at them a prepaid account. So similarly, entertainment wallet, health wallet, and you know, other kinds of travel wallets are going to be some opportunity. So if I have the account, how do I access those accounts? So I'm sure most people are familiar with internet banking, mobile banking, the mobile apps, and all that. So we do provide those services to our customers as well and enable them to couple their banking products using the digital channels to use the payment service. So let's make sense if I, I, I hear absolute silence. So how does it finally look like? It looks like something like this, right? So, so imagine it from a use case perspective. So these are Merchant, merchant ordering channels. So I phone call my, I give a phone call to a railway office and I am able to pay a ticket using my either phone, ATM, mobile, internet. So there are multiple payment channels and there are multiple ordering channels. So this will, and here does set the technology which all enables this. <coughs> So the customer is able to buy, if you look at the bottom left, buy, pay and the merchant gets it delivered. So how does the bigger picture of inclusive ecosystem look like? So in the middle are the channels and on the left hand side you see that all these services are aggregated with, for the bank and unbanked accounts. And these are the different value propositions being it mobile remittance, utility bill payments, stock bus, taxes, toll. So we have an umbrella have experience in a lot of them. We'll talk about this a little while later. But uh, this is something that is that we envision is uh, an inclusive system where we so the people who are unbanked currently and who are banked currently they can you know, combined to make this a, a viable delivery solution of home of inverted remittances into Pakistan. 
through our you know customer banks. So I'm sure there is a lot of opportunity in Bangladesh of converting those 12, 13 billion dollars that you receive annually through banking channels. So we do internet banking and mobile banking and mobile apps. I all categorize that in one. But obviously there are four different flavors. As I said in my slide as well, so these are digital channels which are for different set of customers. Internet banking is for high bandwidth customers. Then there is a web like banking for the what you call that uh, tablets and tablets uh, segment. Then we have a mobile app which is a native version app. And then obviously we have uh, USSD banking. So for the telco channels, the guys who know it, so we have eight ten banks who we have aggregated using the USSD channel. Um, we work with card schemes and obviously we talk, talk a lot about the bill payments products and the payment gateway. So digital commerce product, so we are uh, working with multiple customers. Uh, Central Bank of Dubai, I talked about that, is using our payment gateway for uh, settling the, for the national web commerce. Central banks, third party processes, microfinance banks, public sector institutions, telecom operators and financial institutions. So this is 130 customers in all our 30 countries. So we have about 75% share of the only banking transactions process in Pakistan, which is growing about 9500 dollars uh, 26 dollar sign has not been there, 26 million cards in circulation and about 40 million ATM transactions monthly. So the guys know it, we have PSS verified company which and also have bought it multiple times, picked up awards in one of them. And so a little bit we are proud of the story, so probably this comes also again as another uh, repeat. But one link which is the national switch as well as the first payment service provider in Pakistan. Uh, it's a journey, this is their their journey. They launched in 2000 with three member banks, first gateway provider in 2005 to 17 member banks, have multiple schemes now that their partners are acquiring. So not only does the bank telecom operators, we have been trusted by the central banks as well. Central Bank of UAE is our customer for the national payment gateway, for e-commerce supply, and central bank of Liberia for interoperability with their accounts and their mobile wallets as well. Summarizing our six products, so our internet banking proposition is for optimism. IRS, for some people who use our services, know that we have six uh, customers of these in Pakistan, or uh, in Bangladesh, sorry. So our bill payment system, our home remittance system, which is our for cross-border worker remittances, so prepaid card management system, and our digital commerce solution for free access. So a repeat maybe, but it shows up. All the countries that we have are deployments in. So you can check it out on, on LinkedIn and Facebook. And I think that could be all before I so this is one snapshot of my own experience of that an opportunity to work with banks, telecom operators in the supply chain. So so this today what we have talked about is more from my own personal perspective of how I have interacted with multiple industries, banking, non-banking and technology, work with payment system providers and operators and in the consulting business to deliver you the goods to them. So with this I think I have, to, uh, I have everything that I had to say and I would be ready for questions that you may have. Please. You mentioned something about connecting those who doesn't happen right. with those who do happen right. to RTGS. Didn't get it. I it hard to oh. So, if we look at the split, so imagine this: there are two kind of kind of transactions. It's mostly they're busy who has an account with a commercial bank in Bangladesh, and there is an entity which distributes wallet for free cash. So, the ability to send money from my, let's say. Uh, 
Dhaka bank account to another trust bank account is an account to account transaction which will be enabled through uh, RTCS, right? Now in Pakistan how it is done is that these uh, accounts which are digital wallets are also, because it's also a bank led model, so it also has a bank at the back. So those banks settle amongst themselves. So for example, if I have, I have an easy pesa wallet, so today it will be able to accept not only money from an easy pesa wallet, it can also accept money from a standard charter. So this is the first, or probably one of the first ever transactions that we have built for interbank funds. So this is a two-leg transaction, a very unique transaction, probably not that I have kind of experienced it in many parts of the world. It's a two-leg transaction. In the first leg, there is a title fetch. So if I want to send, you, your name, sir? Kamran. Kamran. So if I want to send money to Kamran, so I will write your, uh, you know, the account number. And now there's another product called, if your mobile number is there. So if I write your mobile number or your account number and send that instruction via IRS platform to another bank, so they will return. So this is, again, this is the middle body is the one link operation, which is the national payment system. So the other bank will return the name of the person to me and would confirm whether I want to do the transaction for that individual. And then I will push in the amount and then the works across different delivery channels. Teller interface is another channel, right? So the, the counter teller at the bank branch is also one channel of addressing the customer. So if there are two banks, one has IRS and the other one has IRS, then the, or another switching product, we can connect to both of them and the transactions will be routed through one form or another. So would that answer the question? that uh, I thank you ladies and gentlemen uh, for your time and